Our service today focuses on the legacy of one of our universalist forebears, Olympia Brown. Uh, just a show of hands, who had heard of Olympia Brown before this morning? All right, some of you. Olympia Brown was born outside of Kalamazoo and Prairie Run Township on January 5th, 1835. As a universalist, she was raised to believe in the importance of education, equality, and freedom of religious thought. After finishing her primary education in a school that her father built on their farm for her, she set off for Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. At the time, Mount Holyoke was heavily influenced by Calvinism, and so she was miserable. <laughs> After just one year, she transferred to Antioch College in Ohio, which was run by Horace Mann. So just a brief aside, Horace Mann was a Unitarian and later became the father of American public education. His liberal philosophies about education were more in line with how Brown had been raised and what she expected to get out of the experience. So she thrived at Antioch. After finishing her degree, she, against all odds, somehow managed to gain admittance to seminary. At the time, ministry was exclusively a career for men, and seminaries were therefore only open to men. You may have heard of the 19th century female seminaries, but those were not divinity schools. I don't know why they called them that. Well, as nights, but they were not where you went to learn about the Bible or God. Brown was rejected out of hand by the Unitarian School in Meadville. <coughs> she was rejected by Oberlin. Finally, she received a letter of admission, kind of, from the Universal School at St. Lawrence. The president of the school included the following line. He did not think that women were called to ministry, but I leave that between you and the great head of the church. So when Olympia Brown arrived to begin seminary in the fall of 1861, St. Lawrence was unprepared for her in so many ways. <laughs> the school's president thought that his letter had been so harsh and discouraging that she would not come, so he did not share the news of her admittance with the rest of the school. <laughs> that line that had meant to be such a crushing blow actually felt like fuel on her fire. Well, fine, if it's between me and God, God's on my side. <laughs> she was convicted her call to the ministry, and there was nothing that was going to stand in her way. After finishing her seminary education in St. Lawrence, Olivia Brown achieved another impossibility. She was ordained by the Universalist faith with full ecclesiastical standing. So there's a lot of different ways that this is described, a lot of different language used to say what happened and, and what this meant. It's a lot of splitting hairs that certain ministers and some historians like to debate, but I'm pretty sure you don't want to get into all that deeply. So we'll just say this. And women have always found ways to be in religious leadership, one way or another. And it's come with different titles and different descriptors. Olympia Brown was the first woman to have what most people think of as full-time official ordination. She was the first woman to have the authority to preach and perform rites of passage freely without a man as her supervisor. She went on to serve congregations in Weymouth, Massachusetts, Bridgeport, Connecticut, and Racine, Washington. And of course, the only pulpits that were open to her were the ones that nobody else wanted. <laughs> Every congregation she served had had some scandalous period, was now facing financial collapse. She faced adversity, repeated attempts to supplant her ministry with that of a man, but she met every challenge with that same unwavering commitment to her call to ministry. She continued to use adversity as fuel and made her better and it made her stronger. Throughout her ministerial career, Brown was a champion of women's suffrage which is where a lot of people know her from. She was passionate for her. During her time, the 
the church in Weymouth. She took a four-month leave of absence to tour Kansas, agitating for the right to vote. And during those four months, she delivered over 300 speeches while also arranging all of her own travel and accommodations. And ultimately, the Kansas effort failed, but she garnered 30% of the vote in favor of women's suffrage. And that was considered a huge victory. After nine years serving at the Universalist congregation in Racine, she left full-time ministry in order to fully devote herself to women's suffrage. She found community and friends amongst the new, younger, radical leaders of the women's suffrage movement, people including Alice Paul, Lucy Barnes. By this time, she was in her 80s, but her commitment to the movement was strong and her passion was still fierce. One of her greatest acts of civil disobedience was in 1919, when Woodrow Wilson was president. She was frustrated with his lack of support for women's suffrage, and so she publicly burned a bunch of his speeches in front of the White House. <laughs> <laughs> Several months later, the 14th Amendment was ratified, and Olympia Brown was able to vote in a presidential election at the age of 85. She was one of a very few of the original suffragists who lived long enough to do so. She died six years later in Baltimore, survived by her two children, preceded in death by her beloved husband. She is remembered as a firebrand, a pioneer, and an ardent universalist. Now, I've been trying to think of a professional churchy way to say this, <laughs> but I can't, so I'm just going to say it. Olympia Brown was a total and complete badass. <laughs> There's just no other way to say it. Because of her many accomplishments, she is listed in the Michigan Women's Historical Center and Hall of Fame, along with someone else we know, Marilyn Kelly. <laughs> Universalists. 
Universalists believed that their primary task in life was to build the kingdom of God on earth. Now, I realize that the phrase kingdom of God may not have a lot of currency with modern Unitarian Universalists, but it was, and it remains, a radically liberal concept. If heaven was established on earth, what would that be like? They thought of God as a benevolent father to all of humanity, who was the creator of life, the bringer of justice, a deity willing to spend three days in hell redeeming every soul. They believed that God was the source of fairness, love, and compassion. To build the kingdom of God on earth is to found a society rooted in those same qualities. And anything that stood in the way of building this heaven on earth was hell. Hell was no longer a place of eternal damnation after death, but a way of living that made people miserable. War, violence, poverty, slavery, addiction, these were hell. For the Universalists, heaven and hell are lived experiences brought into being through our actions. And that is a very brief overview, but it gives you some insight into the justice work of the Universalists and how we got to where we are today. It gives you an idea of what Olympia Brown probably heard growing up, and maybe some of what she preached. Her dedication to justice work was centered on women's right to vote. The disenfranchisement of women is a justice matter on its own merit. Giving women the right to vote gave women power. And that power could be used to build political capital and to improve the lives of women and their children. Olympia Brown was convicted that there could be no kingdom of God on earth while women were disenfranchised from the vote. The God that she knew had created all human beings, and stripping some of them of social and political power on the basis of their gender was an affront to that God. I cannot, none of us can imagine the difficulty and the constant obstacles that Olympia Brown faced in her lifetime. Every single point in her biography is the story of a setback overcome. She was guided by her convictions, and she was sustained by her faith. As modern Unitarian Universalists, most of us have different beliefs than Olympia Brown and her contemporaries. Most of us don't believe that anymore. But their clarity, purpose, has been preserved for us in our seven principles. Unitarian and universalist beliefs were interwoven in our principles along with humanist values. And that universalist heritage for me is most clearly on display in that sixth principle. The goal of a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Unitarians care about justice, too, and I don't mean to imply it otherwise. But this vision of a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, that is our modern understanding of what our universalist forebears call the kingdom of God. The Quakers call it the peaceful kingdom. It's our vision of a world perfected where everyone shares in the bounty of life. Everyone has a common destiny. This is what we work towards when we do justice work. It's what we aspire to in our congregations. The world may hold where everyone counts and everyone has what they need. And certainly, everyone has a vote. This is a bold vision, a prophetic vision. It is easy to be overwhelmed with all of the reasons why 
like building this world community of fairness is impossible. But we can't let that keep us from trying. If you feel daunted by our work of building a peaceful, just, liberatory world, I suggest three things. One, break a goal down into smaller, more manageable tasks. Just take one more step. Women's suffrage was not one overnight. It was a small, a series of small successes for decades. Two, make sure that you have the right people around you to do this work. Justice work is built on community. It is not the work of a single individual. Olympia Brown aligned herself with different people over the course of her life, which enabled her to do different kinds of activism. But she never did it by herself. She always had a support network. And three, find a guide to inspire you, and to give you strength. If Olympia Brown could be told no at every turn and shouted down and harassed by angry mobs and still found the tenacity to carry on, so can we. And she is just one of several guides from our history. There are many more to choose from. So find the right one for what you're working on and draw strength from their story. These are three things that we can learn from the life of Olympia Brown. And there are, of course, more. As we go on doing the work of building a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, let us remember Olympia Brown and the things that she accomplished against all odds in her lifetime. It was all impossible until it wasn't. Let our work be a testament to her legacy.